Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. The 2037 regular season is complete and our Buffalo Wings are headed to the playoffs for a 10th consecutive season and we have won the National League East for a 6th consecutive season. So it has been a successful regular season on the field for Buffalo but as we all know, what really matters is what happens in the playoffs, and our Buffalo Wings are trying to defend a world championship from last year. Don't have the same type of uh, MVP home run ribby machine power in our lineup as we did the last three seasons when we had Shamar Jenneret. But that said, we've obviously had a successful regular season, and the hope is that we can continue winning in these upcoming playoffs. And as we usually do with the off days built into the schedule for the playoffs, uh, we're switching to 12 pitchers and 14 position players on our roster. No surprises, the starting rotation is Barajas, Shazier, the rookie Mendoza, and Estrada. The only change is that uh, we have moved Mendoza, the rookie, up to be our number three starter uh, and have the veteran Juan Estrada as our fourth starter. Mendoza has been really impressive, probably going to be the National League Rookie of the Year. And uh, you look at him compared to Estrada and his stuff, his movement and his control are all in theory better has a little more stamina, doesn't throw quite as hard, and he's a righty rather than a lefty, but want to ensure that uh, Mendoza gets perhaps a little more opportunity to start games for us than Juan Estrada. Uh, the bullpen, pretty high quality. Chris Bloomquist, who we picked up in a trade, uh, is our closer. Lauren Walborn in that high-volume stopper role that he has excelled in for us for several years. I'm going to have three setup men for the playoffs. The lefty Juan Valiz, Johanne Varejo, and Eldon Jimenez. Hayden Yinger and Darnell Polite will be our middle relievers. And our number five starter, Isidro Ochoa, will be a long reliever when and if we need one. So who does that mean uh, didn't make the roster? Uh, David Espinosa, who we called up at the end of the year. Not a shock. Robbie McCracken who uh, was a Rule 5 pick last year, just came off the IL. Juan Reynoso, who we picked up to be a uh, potential spot starter for us. And then Mike Waters, who has been uh, shuttled back and forth between AAA and the majors for the last few years, uh, also misses out on at least the initial playoff roster for us this year. And moving on to our position players, uh, Bobby Bowling's recent injury, uh, which was suffered at the beginning of September, herniated disc, going to be out for another three weeks, leaves a definite hole in our lineup, had a 116 WRC plus for us, uh, 15 homers and 24 doubles in 403 at-bats, stole 29 bases for us. Not as dynamic offensively as he's been in some previous seasons, but still a loss for us. And as we get to the playoff roster, um, there's no real surprises on the team. It's basically the roster we've gone with all year. Uh, the only exceptions are that uh, September call-ups, Frank Carranza and Ben Elmquist end up uh, both making the team. Probably would have only been one of them if uh, Bolig was healthy. Uh, unfortunately for us, he's not. And that actually means that uh, Carranza, as a rookie, is going to be hitting number three for us against right-handed pitchers. Carranza did come up and do a nice job for us. Hit 333 with five homers and 96 at-bats. Um, small sample size, clearly, but feel like the left-handed hitting Carranza is our best option uh, against right-handed pitching. And then Elmquist is going to go into the lineup uh, as our left fielder against left-handed pitching. So both of the uh, rookies are going to get some playing time in the playoffs. Elmquist primarily playing against left-handed pitching, didn't get as many at-bats. 
uh, but did still hit 385 with three extra base hits in 26 at bats. So both uh, Elmquist and Carranza were productive in a small sample size, and both of them are going to get chances to play uh, every, well, not every day, but against righties or lefties with the injury to Bolig. Uh, what putting the two of them in the lineup means is that uh, Dylan Carlson is still just a bat off of our bench after a uh, pretty brutal regular season, hit a buck 71 with six homers for us. Awful WRC plus and below replacement level when all was said and done. Uh, he was a starter for us the first half of the year. Moved him to a platoon role where he's only playing against lefties for a month, month and a half. And then honestly, uh, in September, once we called up Carranza and Elmquist, he's really just been a bench player for us, which is what he will continue to do in the playoffs. And taking a quick look at the playoff tree before the first round wildcard series get underway, uh, we were the NL East winners, best record in baseball. We'll have the home field advantage as long as we survive. We will end up facing either the 92-win Rockies or the 92-win Phillies. Uh, the Rockies have been a team that's given us some trouble in the playoffs over the years. While the Phillies are a strong team we know well from our division, so no easy answers there. Uh, the NL West winning Cubs who will face off against the Braves or the Reds. Uh, AL West winning Mariners, best record in the American League, will face the Brewers or the Orioles. And the AL East winning Blue Jays will face off against the Rangers or the Twins. And there ended up being three sweeps in the wild card series. Uh, the Twins, the Braves, and the Phillies all won two to nothing. Uh, and the Orioles edged the Brewers two to one to move on to the ALDS. So we are going to be facing off against our divisional rival, the Philadelphia Phillies. As we uh, had mentioned, uh, they had a 92 win team, so they ended up 10 games behind us in the standings this year. However, uh, they had our number. We were 5 and 8 against Philadelphia during the regular season. Uh, they have the number one offense in the National League with 868 runs scored. So a pretty good margin between them and us. Uh, we rank second in the National League in runs scored. Uh, the difference is the pitching staffs, where we were number two in the NL in runs against, and they were number 13 in runs allowed. So something's going to have to give here. Will it be Philadelphia's incredible offense, or will it be our excellent pitching staff that gives? If we can uh, hold the Phillies' big offense down, feel pretty good about our chances, but certainly with a 5-8 and eight record against them, uh, even though we've got home field advantage, this series certainly doesn't look like an easy win for us. And the good news for us, despite our challenges with Philadelphia during the regular season, is that we are completely rested and completely healthy, with the exception of Bolig. Uh, shortstop Steve Anderson has recovered from the hamstring that hampered him over the last several days of the regular season. We've got our ace, Alexis Barajas, on the mound, 12-11 and 11, with a 313 ERA this year. So by his standards, was an offseason. Uh, not going to repeat as a Cy Young Award winner. He'll be, uh, be going up against Alpha Nadab, a uh, 26-year-old right-hander. Looks like he is a pretty average major league pitcher, 10-12 and 12 this year with a 443 ERA despite the fact that Barajas has had a bit of an off season, Certainly feel like this game won at home with our ace on the mound is one that we will need to win. And unfortunately, we are already in a hole. Uh, six to nothing, we lose. Don't score a run against Philadelphia. Our former closer, Chris Staten, got the save against us. Uh, Barajas took the loss, so uh, we are up against it. I did actually think, based on 
what's happened in Major League Baseball over the last few weeks of switching the divisional series to seven games from five. Uh, I think that's possibly something that the majors are going to have to do in the coming years, given the outcry that we've heard with teams like the Orioles and the Braves and the Dodgers uh, falling early and hard in those series. But I wasn't going to switch things up in the middle of the season. It is something I'm considering for next year. Uh, don't think that there's a factor in the game that has us coming out rusty, although with only five hits, who knows. Um, five single hits by people. We did get doubles from Carranza and Seifu, so two extra base hits among our five. But a uh, good offensive day for the Phillies. Uh, they got a couple of doubles, and it looks like a uh, two-run homer from Jake Spring. Barajas with a less than stellar outing, four hits and three walks, three earned runs over four and two thirds. Yinger and Walborn came on for some good relief, uh, but Darnell Polite was not good. Didn't really matter since we didn't score a run anyways. Nadab was fine, uh, didn't get enough innings pitched to qualify for the W, but scattered three hits and two walks while striking out eight over four and two thirds. So we find ourselves in an early hole in this uh, divisional series here in 2037. Move on to game number two. And we've got Sincere Shazier, who perhaps had the best uh, season of his career this year. 14-7 and seven with a 2.82 ERA, 4.1 war for our number two starter. So feel good with Shazier on the mound. He's going against Zaire Jackson, a uh, right-hander with some incredible stuff. Uh, his changeup, his screwball are both off the charts. And he has an excellent fastball as well. 16 and 11 with a 421 ERA. Uh, not surprisingly, more than a strikeout per inning this season. Led the American League a couple years ago with 259 strikeouts. And then it looks like he probably had some injury issues in 2036. But not an ideal pitching matchup for us against someone who could easily strike out 10, 12, 15 batters. Uh, but we'll see if we can get something going here in game two and we do get a six to one victory to bounce back shazier with the win got a home run from andres baby big baby funky cole medina jumped out with a run in the first on a run scoring double by heiner and then um, came back to take the lead for good in the bottom of the third uh, three hits for Seifu today, and he scored three runs. Uh, a couple of hits for Estrada and the rookie Gallagher as well. So 12 hits total as we do get the bats going. Uh, the home run we talked about, Medina solo shot in the eighth. Uh, a couple of steals for Seifu and one for Estrada as well. Shazier, uh, excellent. Six hits, no walks, one earned run over six innings. Got two innings out of Walborn, and then Hayden Yinger came on and pitched the ninth for us uh, with the big lead. So we bounce back. Tim Gaglia injured while throwing the ball. Wait to hear what's going on with him. Hopefully it's not too serious. Would think injured while throwing the ball. Um, probably either very minor or very severe, and we'll find out uh, shortly, I'm sure. And a bit frustrating, we've simmed ahead two days, and Gaglia is still diagnosis pending, he would think, over the course of 48 hours in the middle of a playoff series with modern medicine and diagnostics being what they are. We could figure out what was going on with Gaglia uh, in that time span, uh, but unfortunately we have not. So we are now in Philadelphia and we will be without uh, Gaglia, certainly, for this game. We have the rookie, Alexis Mendoza, as I talked about after a 15-7 and season, 216 strikeouts, 335 ERA, 
and a team best among our pitchers. Six war. Think he will likely be a rookie of the year uh, in about a month. He'll be going up against Danny Markle, a left-handed pitcher for the Phillies. 30-year-old was 11 and 8 with a 5.46 ERA. His Sierra was almost two runs better than that. So think we should be favored in the pitching matchup, but we are on the road in Philadelphia facing a team that seems to have had our number this year, so there are certainly no guarantees. And Philadelphia does take it to us once again. Their offense erupts. They beat us 9-2. to two. Uh, They got a couple of homers from Jake Spring, who continues to have a hot bat. We did get a homer from Joe Edwards, uh, but we are now Backs against the wall here, down 2-1. to one. And uh, they jumped upon us early and off, and they had one in the third, but then five in the fifth. I guess it's not really that that early, but that five-run fifth certainly hurt us. Uh, we hadn't scored a run until the ninth when we got our two runs, so uh, we were down 9 to nothing before we even put a run on the board. Only three hits today, Seifu, Flores, and Edwards. Uh, so their pitching once again dominates us, um, and it was uh, an effort by the entire team. Marco was injured, and Mendoza was actually also injured. Both of the pitchers went out in the third inning, uh, but their bullpen picked up the slack. Uh, our bullpen with Inger, Polite, Veliz, and Ochoa all giving up runs uh, clearly did not, so... Could have been perhaps a different situation if uh, Mendoza had not gotten hurt as he hadn't allowed a hit in two and two-thirds innings. But uh, hopefully it's not a serious injury. Um, but even more importantly than what's going on with the health of Gaglia and Mendoza right now is going to be us uh, figuring out a way to win Game 4 in Philadelphia tomorrow. And still no report on what is going on with Mr. Gaglia or Mr. Mendoza. Uh, Mendoza hamstring soreness day to day for a week. Um, so that's not the end of the world. Gaglia still diagnosis pending. So that unfortunately uh, has us down a player as we head into game four. And we're down a player in Gaglia, and we are down 2-1. to one. If we lose this, our efforts and our hopes of defending our World Series championship will have come to an end. We've got the veteran left-hander Juan Estrada on the mound. 16-10 and 10 record, the most games he's ever won for us, but his ERA did increase to 4.19 this year. That said, his Sierra kind of where it's always been. Uh, the veteran lefty has typically been a pretty good player for us in the playoffs. You can see he's been a divisional series MVP uh, three times in his career. And other than a couple of years ago, he has typically been a very dominant pitcher during the playoffs. Going up against Kevin Navarro, uh, a right-hander for the Phillies, 28-year-old, was 9-4 and four with a 4.11 ERA this year. Would think that the pitching matchup uh, favors us slightly, but uh, we've got to start scoring some runs against uh, this Phillies team. We've got two runs total in the two games that we lost, and uh, clearly if we only score a run here today, it's going to be very hard for us to get the W. And it's over. We only scored two runs, uh, three to two victory for the Phillies. And we have been knocked out of the playoffs, upset in the league championship series. Uh, you would say it's an upset because we are the, or were the number one seed, had the best record in baseball, and were the defending World Series champions. Uh, but clearly with that 5-8 and eight record against Philadelphia, there was something with the way they were built that we had difficulty handling and uh, ended up showing up in this series where in the, four in the three losses, we scored only four total runs. Um, we did get six in that Game 2 win in Buffalo. But other than that, not a lot of offense for us. Uh, certainly could argue that if we still had Shamar Jenneret, uh 
it may have been better. It would have been hard for it to have been worse. We actually took a 2 nothing lead here in the fourth. They came back with runs in the bottom of the fourth and the sixth to tie it. And then they walked us off in the 11th with uh, Saliers with a solo home run against our mercenary closer, Bloomquist. Um, so that was not the way we wrote this up. Nobody on our team had multiple hits, even though it was an 11-inning game. Estrada did fine, four hits and a walk, one earned run over five. Uh, Jimenez came in and blew the save. Walborn gave us really good relief for a couple of innings, as he often does, and then went to the closer, who ended up uh, pitching two innings for us and giving up that series losing and season-ending home run. So not the way we hoped this would end. Um, can't say that without having Generet on the team, I'm shocked that we struggled to generate some offense, but we were still the number two offensive team in the National League this regular season. So although we didn't have the big home run bat in Generet, um, we still were able to generally generate some offense this year. So I'm not going to second-guess that decision. I wanted to keep Seifu around, and with the fact that we've got the 20th highest budget in baseball, uh, sometimes you have to make some tough decisions and uh, want to see what Seifu can do over the course of his career with us, and Seifu certainly was not the problem in the playoffs. Uh, I know he had a hit, at least one hit in every game, so I think... Uh, given the lack of offense that we put up uh, this offseason or this postseason, my assumption is that Seifu was probably our uh, most productive offensive player. Um, six for 18 with a double, a triple, 333 average, stole those two bases in the victory. Um, so he kind of did what we would hope a leadoff hitter to do. Um, Clearly, the rest of the team did not generate the offense that we would have hoped. And because of that, uh, an early exit for our Buffalo Wings this year, the 102-win season, and as I talked about, a sixth straight NL East title. Uh, but we will kind of lose the opportunity to stamp this team as a dynasty. If we had won this year, giving us three world championships in four seasons, uh, you can start throwing the D word around, but uh, right now the only D word we're going to use to describe this season for the Buffalo Wings is disappointment. And even more disappointing and depressing about our loss is that uh, despite having the best record in baseball, we have been the first team officially vanquished here in the NLD or the division series overall. And we just got the diagnose from Tim Gagley, a strained oblique out for five weeks. I uh, don't know why that took about four days to figure out. Uh, don't think that it made a difference in the series. We just weren't hitting uh, with or without him. But uh, at least it's not something that will... Uh, linger to next season and hopefully he'll be a hundred percent for us as we uh try to get this team back on track in 2038 and with our season over uh and the minor league seasons over at this point got one good piece of news uh, ben elmquist who as we mentioned joined us uh, towards the end of the year and ended up making the playoff roster was named the International League MVP after a year when he hit 322, 30 homers, 102 ribbies. Uh, former first round draft pick for us three years ago out of Lander University. Likely to have a relatively important role on our team next year. Would expect him to be in the mix to be our starting center fielder along with the likes of Gaglia and Hardage. And uh, it's possible one or two of those guys end up playing a corner outfield spot for us as well. And given that for the last several years we've been making long playoff runs at this mid-October uh, time period, 
haven't spent a lot of time in October on the international amateur free agents in the last several seasons. Um, so our early exit gives us an opportunity to preview uh, some of those guys for those of you who are interested in what the class looks like. You may remember uh, last year's class was relatively top heavy. Um, doesn't look like the pitching class is particularly impressive, at least based on an early assessment. Sergio Herrera out of Colombia looks like a decent pitching prospect. We're very low accuracy on him right now, as we are with most of these players, but looks like a guy who could have a three to six pitch arsenal, um, decent stuff, control, and above average movement if he completely develops extreme ground baller with that good movement so shouldn't give up too many home runs especially given the ground baller tendencies uh only 16 years old throwing in the low to mid 90s other than his greed has generally pretty positive personality traits so i don't hate dudu jirena as a potential pitching prospect for us uh, just kind of looking at the stuff, movement, and control potential. Uh, a couple other interesting guys. Zhao Dao Chen out of Australia. Another guy who looks like a uh, good personality and could be a competent major league pitcher. Edgar Serrano uh, questioned the movement a little bit. And he could very well end up being a two-pitch guy. A little less intrigued by him as the others. Solano Toselli, a 17-year-old out of Brazil, uh, looks like his fastball sinker and cutter are likely to be major league quality when all is said and done. Uh, question is whether he'll add a fourth pitch with that changeup, but not a uh, completely uninteresting prospect. And then Ernesto Zambrana is uh, the low floor high ceiling prospect not even yet 16 years old uh, we think he's got potential for his fastball his change and his sinker and his splitter to all be off the charts uh, which would combine to give him amazing stuff he also happens to have incredible movement question with him is his control potentially uh, but he is not an uninteresting prospect uh, he's also looking for a ton of money compared to most of these other pitchers but for players that our scout sees as having only two and a half or three star potential it's actually to me a somewhat intriguing pitching class to think about turning to the position players uh, we'll look at all of them who are three and a half star potential or higher so six players uh Starting off with a couple of right fielders, Juan Larios, 16-year-old out of the Dominican. Uh, has a little bit of speed, like the durability. Not great defensively, but looks like he could have an interesting bat. Not going to walk very much, but not a completely useless prospect, certainly. Another right fielder, Andres Castillo, a little older out of the Dominican, uh, Better arm, less speed, some personality quirks. Don't like the bat quite as much, and he's also older, as we said. If I were going to go after one of these guys, it would certainly be Larios, who's looking for less money than Castillo, all else being equal. Uh, moving on to the two four-star prospects, according to our scout, Andres Perdomo, 16-year-old center fielder out of the Dominican. Pretty good range and a nice arm. Uh, the bat certainly with 70 contact, 65 gap power, and 60 home run power with uh, decent speed could be a pretty interesting bat if he fully develops. Right fielder Rodolfo Guerrero out of Colombia. More of a corner outfielder, has a little bit of speed, like the durability, and again, if he completely develops, it's a somewhat interesting bat. So I don't hate either of them, not in love with either of them. I think probably Larios, to me, is the best value of those four, potentially. But there's no guarantees that Larios won't end up going for 4.75 or even 5.7 million when all is said and done. 
And the top two prospects, according to our scout, are Juan Palomo out of the Dominican. I like this guy. He is a uh, infielder, decent range, acceptable arm, decent at turning two. Uh, could certainly play second or third pretty competently. Don't think he's a shortstop. Don't think he's a gold glover at any of those positions, but a guy who can play some competent infield while also potentially having a uh, interesting bat is certainly a useful player. Can see why our scout likes him, and he's not looking for a ton of money yet. And then there's Horatio Gineco, 16-year-old out of Venezuela. I think his rating is really just driven by that potential 70 home run power because other than that, the rest of his traits look to be pretty average. But uh, if you can be a average contact hitter who can hit 35, 40 home runs and walk 80, 90, 100 times, uh, that's clearly a use, useful player. Uh, not much speed, doesn't bring much to the table defensively, and he's really a corner infielder most likely a first baseman uh, so not a horrible prospect um, but I honestly think um, Palomo the shortstop and Larios the right fielder for at least what their initial demands are are the guys that I'd in initially be most interesting in pursuing and maybe try to mix in a couple of those position players with uh, a pitcher or two from this list. But clearly, uh, we've got three months until the international amateur free agent period signing, signing period begins in mid-January. So we will know a lot more, hopefully, about all of these players uh, before that begins. And we've invited all six of the position players that we think are three and a half star or higher prospects along with four of the five pitchers that we talked about uh, to our initial international amateur camp this year. We will run the practice and uh, move ahead a day to see what our scouts assessment is of the players that we saw. And none of the players that we brought into the camp were a disappointment. Um, our scout highlighted Andres Castillo, the right fielder. He was someone we were a little less constructive on simply because of the numbers he was looking for in terms of his contract and uh, that low work ethic and to a lesser extent adaptability. Horatio Gineco, the third baseman, uh, we liked him as well, at least our scout did, although it doesn't look like our assessment of him has really changed based on that one uh, one touch point that we've had so far. But in terms of uh, running more camps and certainly doing some more scouting of all these players, hopefully by the time we have to make some decisions in January, we will have a uh, pretty good read on these players and their potential. And taking a look at the playoffs now, uh, it turns out that we weren't the only uh, top seed in a league that was taken out because the AL leading Seattle Mariners also got taken out by the Orioles. So it'll be the Orioles against the AL East winning Toronto Blue Jays and the Phillies against the NL West winning Chicago Cubs in the league championship series this year. And the Phillies and the Orioles continue their rampage through the playoffs this year as wildcard teams. Uh, Orioles took out the Blue Jays in five, and the Phillies took out the Cubs in six. Uh, so impressive playoff performances from both teams. Uh, they each ended up taking out uh, both of the division winners in their respective leagues so that's an impressive performance and uh, I believe we will have a rematch of the 1983 World Series here in 2037 between Philadelphia and Baltimore and it ended up being an epic World Series uh, but the Phillies outlasted the Orioles four games to three 
So that offense of Philadelphia ended up uh, proving to be quite an asset in the playoffs. Looks like uh, the Phillies scored one run, four, but then 13, nine, then only two and zero in losses, but then five in the final game of the playoffs. Nadab, who uh, I believe was the pitcher against us in game one, which we lost, ended up getting the W in game seven of the World Series. And that number one National League offense of the Philadelphia Phillies that uh, caused us problems both in the regular season and in the postseason ends up helping guide the Phillies to a World Series championship here in 2037. And with the off-season beginning, that means it is time to start making some decisions. Uh, Eddie Mosley, the wrecked left-hander, we signed to a uh, three-year contract with a couple of options last year, uh, ended up doing little for us, uh, pitched just one game in the majors, and then he was on a rehab assignment in Albany when he ended up... Uh, suffering a more serious injury and needed surgery to remove bone chips in his elbow. The fact that he only pitched one game for us and the fact that he's wrecked physically and the fact that he's going to be 34 early next year would suggest that we just move on from him. Still has a profile that to me is somewhat useful as a guy who could start or relieve and a left-handed arm. Uh, the number is only 1.8 million next year. I don't know that we're going to exercise it, but I'm not willing to just uh, say, I hate you, Eddie Mosley, because you only pitched a third of an inning for us and you're getting older and you're wrecked. I uh, want to kind of spend a little time offline as this offseason gets underway envisioning what our 26-man and 40-man rosters will look like next year. Uh, we do have some potential left-handed help uh, coming from the minor leagues, which could work against Mosley. But I want to think that out, even though it's only $1.8 million or 180000 buyout before making that decision. Our market size has increased to below average, so that is positive. Um, We've basically been stagnant for several years with our ticket prices and our budget history, although you can see I haven't opened the email yet, but it looks like we did end up getting a nice bump from 228 to 236, and 236 million is the highest budget that we have ever had uh, for next season with these Buffalo Wings. So although our market size is still below average, um, we've worked at it uh, for long enough and hard enough with these Buffalo Wings in our 10 straight playoff appearances that um, the fans in Buffalo are willing to spend a little more money. So hopefully that means that we can also generate a little more revenue through perhaps a bit higher ticket prices. So $236 million available next year as we uh, talked about already. Um, got some retirements. Our hitting coach, Joey DeMonte, has retired, so that will be a big hole for us to fill. He has been there for a while with us, I think maybe even perhaps since the start of this playthrough. Uh, our contract is extended for two years. Uh, we've also lost a manager in the FCL, so we're going to have some uh, personnel changes to make. And if you looked carefully, you noted that um, even with the bump to $236 million, uh, we don't have enough money available at this point unless we start tweaking scouting and player development. And we will at this point need to boost up our international amateur free agent budget, although we don't have the cash to do that. So I am going to initially here just cut these budgets down to somewhat uh, less lesser amounts for scouting and player development. My hope is that certainly when all is said and done, I can get scouting and player development a little bit higher, but just want to actually have a tiny bit of money to play around here in 2038. As we think about our team, 
The big issue is our starting catcher, Andres Medina, is headed to free agency, and he is looking for over $20 million a year for five years. Clearly going to be very difficult for us to fit him back in. We do have some levers that we can press to save some money. Pat Mems uh, was our closer. He's due $7.5 million. He's coming back off of uh, elbow bone chips, and he's wrecked physically at this point, although he has been an effective pitcher for us, an effective pitcher over the course of his major league career. Given where he is physically, if we move on from him, that frees up a little bit of money. Joe Edwards, quite honestly, formerly one of the top prospects in our system, is a player who at $8.2 million so probably high sevens to get him signed. Have to question his roster spot at that kind of money. Hit 211 this past year, 29 homers, 74 ribbies, but a 99 WRC plus, uh, you know, overall a slightly below average offensive player. He is versatile defensively. He draws a lot of walks, which we like. Um, but it's certainly getting to the borderline whether $8 million is worthwhile for him. Lorne Walborn, happy to have him back with the volume we give him at $5 million. Walt Miller, looking for $5 million. He's been our backup catcher last year, although he actually started over Medina for a few years. He is competent defensively. Uh, I don't see there any way that we could have both Medina and Miller back. But it is conceivable if we moved on from Mems, we moved on from Edwards, we moved on from Miller, and maybe make some uh, tough decisions on some of our other lesser paid arbitration eligible players, that we could put ourselves in a position to compete for Andres Medina. Don't know if that's the right decision or not, but that's the type of thing we'll be thinking about. Uh, with the money that Bobby Bowling is making, um, and the fact that we do have some young talent coming up in the outfield. Do we look to move on from him this offseason as 30 years old to perhaps um, clear some space for Medina? So we're going to have some interesting decisions to make, um, and I'll kind of talk through all of those in the upcoming episodes where I do a full deep dive on our roster from last season and how everybody performed uh, so not making any decisions right now, but I do think there will be opportunities for us to let go of some players, trade some players away, and uh, make some modifications to this roster if we do decide that uh, bringing Medina back is the right path. But uh, we are in the very early stages of trying to figure out uh, exactly what those decisions will be for next year. And with that, another season is in the books. As we talked about, the 10 straight playoff appearances and the six consecutive NL East titles are both very positive. Uh, but when all was said and done, the fact remains uh, we got upended 3-1 to one as favorites with home field advantage in the divisional series this year. And uh, quite honestly, it is interesting that uh, the last time we lost 3-1 to one in the divisional series, was uh, the last year that we did not have Shamar Jenneret on our lineup. Uh, the three years we had with Jenneret were com very successful, and uh, we're back to losing 3-1 to one in the Divisional Series this year without him. So a uh, successful regular season, a disappointing postseason, and uh, now it's off to the off season. I talked about some of the... Uh, contract decisions and roster decisions we're going to be focused on over the next few episodes uh, the other thing that is still interesting at least to me to think about and consider is whether this might be the year that Deshaun Seifu finally wins an MVP award uh, it was, and I misspoke, I believe, at the uh, end of the last episode when I said that his 7.1 war was the highest of his career. It's the second highest of his career behind the 8.5 war that he had in 2029, but led the league in hits for a fifth straight year, 
triples for the third time in his career, steals for a 10th consecutive season, hit 300 for a fifth consecutive year, got the 2,000th hit of his career, and put up a 7.1 war, which was tied for second in the National League. Looking at his fielding stats, uh, he was a slightly below average defensive second baseman, um, so although he plays a somewhat important defensive position that may work against him. Uh, the two other guys who were right there with him in terms of batter war, Kendall Pearsall of the Mets, center fielder, um, 298 average, 33 homers, 95 ribbies, 7.1 war. Uh, but the Mets were a horrible team. I'd be disappointed if he won it over Seifu. Um, you know, the Mets 77 and 85. And then Kyle Tucker of the Dodgers, 76 and 86. The right fielder had a uh, nice year, 286, 31 homers, 98 ribbies, led the league with 93 walks, led the league in war with 7.2, 154 WRC+. Plus. Um, 40-year-old Kyle Tucker with a uh, monster year. We actually thought about trying to uh, trade for him near the trade deadline, but he uh, refused to uh, refused to um, waive his no-trade clause. Uh, 147 WRC plus from Pearsall. So from the WRC plus numbers, um, where Seifu is a 131, he's clearly not as... Um, Strong as those two guys, but uh, again, comparing him to uh, Pearsall, who plays a good center field, um, looks like he was an above average center fielder, so that's important. Um, and then Kyle Tucker is a mediocre corner outfielder at this point, although I guess technically by the uh, numbers he was a, a he was an above average defensive right fielder. So it's going to be interesting. Um, 76 win Dodger prospect, a 77 win Met prospect, and our 102 win Buffalo wing prospect um, for MVP. And clearly, there could be other guys. I'm just looking at the top three in the league right here. Um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. It doesn't seem like it's 1987 in Andre Dawson with the Cubs, where his season was so overwhelming compared to the other MVP candidates that he earned the award despite being on a losing team. You know, you look at no one having an absolutely incredible season with a 9 or a 10 war, and you would think that the guy who's on the 102-win team who helped guide that team to 102 wins despite the fact that they lost their best offensive player the previous offseason would uh, get some attention for the Most Valuable Player Award. But uh, we will find out for sure in the coming weeks. Uh, the MVP award announcements are going to be on November 22nd, uh, two weeks from now in game time, although that could be a couple of episodes away uh, as we review our performances for the past season and then also check in on our minor league system and some uh, of our former players around the league, including Shamar Jenneret in uh, the next couple of episodes. So it uh, will be a while till we find out whether Seifu gets to add an MVP award to his trophy case. Uh, he finished second in the voting a few years ago, and then uh, last year I believe he was like fifth or sixth in the voting, um, was not a, a top candidate, but still got some votes. That's kind of the last thing he really needs to do to burnish his Hall of Fame credentials, in my view. So it uh, would be nice to see that happen, and we will find out whether or not it does in our next episode. Or not in our next episode, but in one of the coming episodes. In our next episode, though, as I said, we'll do a deep dive on our roster and start laying out some of our initial plans for the offseason season. If uh, you have ideas on what we should or shouldn't do, always uh, helpful for me to hear them, and I do enjoy hearing them, even if uh, sometimes I do what I'm going to do anyways. Until then, thanks so much for watching. 
and hope you have a great day.